What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Michael Lavisto of Caxi. And before I formally introduce Michael, Michael, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out. And um, your friend, Andy Crestadina of Orbit Media Studios, that was a great episode and he introduced us. So thanks, Andy. Check out that episode. He's just a a treasure trove of knowledge in the space. Um, Also, Todd Tasky. Um, he basically helps and specializes in selling agencies. Uh, he has a second bite podcast, which is in, until talking to him, Michael, I didn't realize, okay, well, some of the, his clients, they will sell at a certain amount and then they'll roll a certain percentage into the new company that was bought by private equity, that private equity is sell for in a couple of years, and they'll make even more on the second bite than they did in the first. So that's cool. So check out Todd Tasky the Second Bite Podcast, and much more. And uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we all businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We help them run their podcast. You know, Michael, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. I found no better way to do that over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire, shout from the rooftops what they're working on, what they're doing, and have them share their advice and expertise with the audience. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com, email us. We're happy to answer anything that you could ask. And today's guest, I am excited, Michael Avista is founder of Caxi, which is a Chicago-based custom software and technology company. They've been helping organizations Michael, can you believe us? Like since 1999, you know, the internet in 1999 was who knows what it was then. I mean, it was it was like the wild west. It was the the beginning of uh, you know most people didn't even know it existed at that time. So they have expertise in user centered design, content management systems, e commerce, mobile application development, and much more. Their past client list is pretty remarkable. Over the past several decades, Motorola, Northwestern University, University of Chicago, American Dental Association, so many more. And Michael, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for the great intro. I'll, I'll try to live up to it. Yeah. You know, so what is life, you know, the, the company look like 1999 to today? Um, you know, it's funny. You, you mentioned like, what was the internet like back then? I mean, it was really like tin cans strung together with wire and everything else. Um, the the reason we founded the company was just ridiculous. It was, there was this thing called the dot-com boom happening. And what it meant was, at least the way we read the newspapers, uh, which were a printed thing that you could read back then, um, that uh, uh, you just had to have an idea, put a dot-com on it, make a million bucks and you were done. Um, so we had- <laughs> That's uh, it. Right. We had this ridiculous idea that worked for about two years, which was we made um, uh, sort of animated uh, semi interactive um, uh, digital pieces that would go on primarily like CD ROMs or kiosks that were sold kind of a digital business card. It just like imagine everything was spinning logos and, you know, over the top, ridiculous, silly animations. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, for people that don't know what a CD ROM is, those kind of went out of favor. Um, and really the story of the company is having to reload on what we focused on probably five or six times since then. So, you know, our, our, our travels took us through um, e-commerce, through, um, you know, content management, some of the stuff you mentioned. And in fact, really, a lot of those things that we kind of stopped doing, uh, if I'm honest, um, like all great web uh, companies, our website is out of date and doesn't really nail it. Uh, that's something we're working on right now. Um, but the story of the company has been um, something that we do gets commoditized and sort of productized. So, you know, when we started, we were doing websites by hand and notepad and, um, uh, you know, and, you know, projects today that, you know, you could do in an afternoon in Wix kind of thing. And so uh, same thing happened with e-commerce. Okay, now there's Shopify and these other things. Okay, let's move on to this other stuff. And where we've really landed is um, uh, just develop uh, from a consulting point of view, solving business problems. But what we're looking for we're looking for companies that want to grow. Typically, we're looking for mid-market. So let's call it 100 million. 
companies that want to go from a hundred million to a billion. And as part of that pan, probably developing kind of enterprise value, maybe selling, maybe exiting, but kind of, we want to be part of the, the business growth. And then what we'll do is we'll add, well, here's a technology roadmap that'll help you get there. And so most of the work we end up doing now is in um, just sort of custom software, generally speaking, but we've done everything from back office applications to mobile to customer experience type things. Um, really, whatever serves that growth is what we're looking to do. We're a very business outcomes focused um, uh, technology company, which is at least a little bit unusual, we find. I think most companies like ours think of themselves as a something, something shop. And, you know, you want something done. OK, here's what it costs to build it. And we build it. We're just not in that business. Yeah. I mean, really, in in life and business, you change or you die, right? And the services, mm-hmm. your services re- really evolve from, you know, the CD-ROM graphics and you mentioned, you know, content management, e-commerce, and now it's evolved to, to today. You know, what would be an example of something that you, like that technology roadmap now and what you're really focused in on? Um, so the, one of the things we find is, um, and uh, here, here comes like blizzard of buzzwords, but um, digital transformation is something I keep trying to find a better phrase for, but it's just, that's sort of the, the milieu that we want to be in. And the idea is that um, as much uh, as we're all aware of all these tools and things that we can do in business, um, I've found that hardly anyone has implemented much of anything to speak of uh, from a digital transformation point of view. And so we love working with companies that see themselves as um, you know, cash generating, profitable, good companies that still run themselves on spreadsheets and things kind of tacked together and homegrown stuff that didn't scale. Those are those are the great fits uh, for us. And there are, you know, I don't know however many, there are thousands of those companies out there. We only need a few to do really, really well. So I think that idea of transforming your company or rethinking, um, you know, if you think of digital transformation is just re-engineering the business to take advantage of the technologies that are available to you and creating a roadmap that doesn't make them out of date, at least some kind of near time horizon, three or five years or something like that. That's kind of where we want to play. Let's talk about, Michael, there was a company in Colorado, very fast growing that ran into these issues, right? Because of yeah. scalability. What did you do with them? So um, this is, so one of the things we run into the most is um, uh, companies whose systems are designed around, um, rigidly designed around how they work right now. And so this company um, is a pretty big flooring company. So they, you know, they come and install your, you know, your uh, tile or wooden floors or something. And, but to the tune of, you know, 30 or $50 million kind of thing. And um, where, uh, where they ran into trouble is their systems were designed around the concept of like a store and a, a location and that kind of thing. And so now what happens if we have multiple stores, multiple locations, we want to go to different States, there's different taxes, all, all that kind of stuff. Their systems are like, I don't know how to do that. Uh, and on top of it, their old system um, was sort of designed um, in sort of a hilariously un-computer um, science uh, friendly way where things were based on, instead of like being, I'm going to get in the weeds here, but like, you know, instead of being based on an ID, they're based on like a name or a thing that could easily go wrong. And so we, we re-engineered a system for them, uh, for starters, that helps them, um, can, so that helps the business think about location and um, how they might scale sort of in a way that, you know, infinitely, but practically, you know. Uh, infinitely um, and just allowed that business to open up because without that, they were kind of the rivets were popping their bus at the seams with, you know, we can't handle these new orders and you know we can't move to this new city because we don't have a way to handle the business kind of thing. And those are, those are great opportunities for them. Cause I feel like we, we sort of unlock, you know, a three or five X growth for them with a, you know, an investment that, you know, would seem, and this is what our goal is. We want the investment with us to seem like, oh my God, any day, you know, if, if we can grow 20 million and spend, you know, uh, a 10th or a 20th of that. Oh my God. So where do we sign? That's, that's the kind of deal that we want to make. For someone like that and a company like that is what's the value proposition. It, it seems like, does that also save their, their staff a lot of time? Like people who are, were having to do things manually as well. Don't have to do things manually. What does it look like yeah. after like project is, you know, done now before, what does the before and after look like? Sure. You know, um, one of the things I feel like is like a like a, a prejudice people bring to consultants coming is everyone everyone always thinks that what's going to happen is things are going to change and everyone's going to get fired. And in doing this, as you mentioned and kind of dated me here, you know, twenty plus years, we've never done a project where the reaction was okay. Now let's fire the people that used to do that. I think most organizations organizations get that um, 
when, when people are doing sort of mundane, like low value tasks, no one wants to pay for that. Like, you know, if your customers found out that, you know, um, you know, 10% of the cost was recopying things in and out of Excel sheets, they'd be sort of like, why are we paying for this? So now when you solve that with the system, all these people that know the business, know the customers, know what you guys do, can offer a higher level of service and something special that is unique and differentiable. I think that's typically where those people end up uh, spending their time. Um, another sort of dirty secret that we've noticed is a lot of times the people who are doing those things end up being like the owners and executives because they can't stomach asking people to do this ridiculous stuff. So, you know, um, if you're an owner listening who is up at night uh, editing the, you know, the work log for things over the weekend, that's the kind of problem we fix. Let's talk ideal client for a second. <clears throat> you get a lot of clients in those industries. I could see how maybe um, like in a services based company like HVAC, window flooring sure. that have just, they started off small and now they've grown to tens of millions of dollars. Um, you know, is that like, what does that ideal client look like for you? Um, I think it's kind of largely attitude and, and um, kind of ability to pay, frankly. So um, I think the, the, the most important thing we're looking for right now is fit and that, um, you know, we want you to like, for example, I don't, I don't want to have part of the project uh, be us convincing you that you're going to have to change your systems. Um, we can do it. I think most of the time people show up with like, listen, here's a great fit customer. We know what we're doing is crazy. We are open to change. We know change is the hardest thing, you know, of, of the, of the three investments, you know, time, money, and change. Everyone always thinks money is the hard one. Well, if you're making, if you're a profitable company, money is easy. Just writing the check is very straightforward. It's the, oh my God, now we got to relearn things. We got the warehouse is going to have to learn new stuff. That's the hard part. But if you're open to it um, and, and you can get your organization aligned around, like, listen, everyone knows this isn't working. We got to do better. We're going to bring in people to th rethink our systems and processes. We'll put something new in. You'll be involved. You'll get buy-in. Um, and we're all excited to roll in the right direction. That's that's the best fit client for us. Um, the ones that the ones that I honestly like to think about, like what we say no to, to kind of define that edge. Um, you know, people who really uh, insist on, um, you know, that that really like, you know, when you go to the doctor and you self-diagnose and you, and you know you've been on WebMD and you're, you're convinced you have whatever horrible thing, and the doctor's like, how about we just do the exam? You know, like I think we're looking for people that are open to the the input. I think is a long. That's my short version of the super long answer I just gave you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all in business we have an ideal fit client, and there's then extreme red flags, and then there's kind of subtle flags along yeah. the way, and. You know, we were talking before we hit record on having the courage to recognize those things. So what are some of the maybe subtle flags that, and now maybe you, you don't take those um, yeah. that have those subtle, you know, red flags as opposed to maybe four, you're like, oh, they, this, this one, this client's probably different, right? Right, right. You know, it's funny, um, uh, in, in some future life, um, I hope I can consult with companies like mine. Um, I feel like I could have saved myself a decade if I learned that lesson a little quicker and to be perfectly honest, still learning it um, because as the, as the owner and, you know, chief uh, salesperson, um, I am more likely obviously to go, you know, I can make that one work or, you know, I could, and, and I think the reality is um, having the courage to be like, listen, what the outcomes for our clients and for us when it's a great fit are that it's fun, it's profitable, things move faster, everyone's excited, everyone wants to still work on it. And when we're done, clients go, that was great, let's do that again. You know, if, if every dollar you spend with us, you make five, yes, let's keep, let's keep going. And so I feel like, you know, when we look at, you know, subtle red flags, um, a lot of it tends to be sort of, um, uh, sort of structural, interpersonal. Um, you know, one, one of the things that we do, and forgive buzzword, but like we do an iterative agile approach, and um, while that's uh, a, a well-known phenomenon in the world, I don't know if it's well understood. And we even have people show up to us sort of asking and hoping for an agile process. And then we tell them what it is. And they go, this sounds terrible. Can't you tell us exactly what's going to happen from the start? And, and it's sort of, uh, um, so that's kind of a, that's, that's a, you know, process is a flag. Um, you know, um, being able to, to see your faults and being sort of like self-deprecating as a business is a, is a really good thing. But if, the flip side is a red flag. Um, so really, I mean, honestly, as simple as it sounds, like we're really looking for a gut feeling of like, you know, this is going to be great. 
Um, it's going to be great. These are great people. It's going to be fun to work with. They have the right kind of attitude, like a kind of a growth mindset. That's something I've, um, uh, wrote a book last year. And that's sort of, I think the key, um, uh, leadership trait that actually makes things happen is thinking that this is possible and we can get through it. Um, and really, you know, as the, um, as the organization and, and for me as the CEO, um, really sticking to those guns, what, even when it seems like, you know, we've all been in those places where it's like, oh, you know, we, we need to make another X this month to make our numbers. I'll take this in. Um, how many times does that four months later become this like death Mars project? You're like, God, if only I would happily have been, you know, 50 K short in March to not have to deal with this now. Um, I think that's the, that's the courage really. I'm, I'm all the pointing fingers are pointing back at me on that one. So that's the, that's the lesson that I kind of have to relearn every now and then. So some of the subtle red flags would be a company maybe not wanting to change, right? Maybe they yeah. come in um, not seeing faults. Like maybe they, you know, you need them to want, I mean, that's part of wanting to change. Like if you don't think anything's wrong, so someone's not yeah. seeing faults and then they don't have a growth mindset uh, either. Um, the, can you break down a little bit about the agile approach? Because I picture, um, you know, again, you're, you're learning about their business and then you're having to fix problems as yeah. you learn how everything connects. Um, yeah. How do you think about that agile approach when you go into a business? So I'm going to start with two quotes. I'm going to butcher because I don't know who exactly these are from. So someone in the comments can correct me, <clears throat> but I think there's some famous general, let's say it's Patton just for fun. Uh, it says something like, um, you know, battle plans are great until the battle starts. And I think there's a better one that I'm going to say it's George Foreman, maybe, uh, who says, you know, everyone goes into the box ring with a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I don't know if it was George Foreman, Mike Tyson, but I've heard that same something one. like, right. Everyone yeah, has a close. plan until you get punched in the face. Yeah. Right. All right. <laughs> so, so I think with um, what we've learned about software um, and again, forgive the, the self plug here, but I, I wrote about this in my book that the idea is that, um, the, I think like the human mind is, is wired up to think like, well, if you're an expert, surely, you know, exactly how this is going to go step by step by step. And you'll know exactly, you know, if we start today at nine, we'll be done June 17th at three forty six in the afternoon and we'll release it. Yeah. And the reality, like everything you've ever done, everything big you've ever done, think about like planning a wedding or, you know, um, I don't know, uh, remodeling a room in a house, whatever. Anything that's like a complex creative process, you're going to run into things like, oh, well, it turns out, you know, with the wedding, uh, you know, the band we wanted isn't available on that weekend. We have to change this or, you know, uh, those kinds of flowers aren't in season or whatever the thing is, you're going to have to adapt. And so with Agile, what we do is we say, generally speaking, we want to accomplish these 10 things and how they get accomplished and in what form that's going to change over time based on the reality of the situation. And so it's all iterative. And, and I think what it does is it allows you to get exactly what you paid for and exactly the right priority. So if we start into something and we realize, you know, we, we prioritize things, so we're doing the most important thing first, we work on that uh, and, you know, things come up that are, that are unusual. We present a new plan. Um, as time goes on, that number 10 thing, it got pushed to the end for some reason, right? And if we're trying to, you know, move quicker or, you know, land on budget or on time, that kind of thing then probably number 10 is a pretty good candidate to kind of work on changing or, you know, modifying. And it's really, it's a way to, to operate in reality and in truth and transparency about what's really actually happening and not some fantasy about, you know, some waterfall Gantt chart where like, you know, at the end of next week at 5 PM, we exactly cut off and exactly move to the next stage, which never in anything you do in life ever actually happens. The, the brain wants it to happen. And so getting to like that perfect fit client, there are people who just can't abide by that. And they just, they, they, they need a fixed thing. And we, we had a, you know, we've had something happen in the last two years where it took us probably nine months to negotiate a contract because they wanted to be, they wanted it to be exactly what they wanted. And um, probably, honestly, that's a flag that we probably just said no to somewhere in the middle of that. And um, uh, you know, the reality is we could have been done by now. And so, you know, what, what did you get by blowing a year of being in the market by trying to be exact about something when we could have been done? I think that's sort of a lesson that is hard to learn. Your book, what's the name? Where can people find it? So you can find it on Amazon. Don't I have one sitting right next to me? Am I, am I that good? It's got to be within arm's reach somewhere. It is, it is. And, uh, and uh, here we go. So it's, 
superpowered, right? Uh, and it's the seven leadership superpowers technology executives can use to grow a more engaged, tech-driven, and profitable organization. Um, and uh, it was, um, uh, I'd, actually, I'd actually written, I, I wanted to write a book. And I, um, I, I thought I had one. I brought it to an editor. And she looked at it and she goes, uh, yeah, um, this isn't a book. Uh, this is random essays crammed together. <laughs> uh, so we came up with this idea uh, and I ended up interviewing about 75 um, technology executives um, to get like kind of like lessons learned and, you know, best ideas, that kind of thing. And of the 70 or so, I think about 20 condensed into what we saw as seven core ideas that seem to be the breakthrough ideas for people as they, um, cause you know, as a technologist, you kind of get, um, it's easy to get pushed into a corner as, you know, the person, you know, who just does the things that the real executives want you to do and to get us just to get a, a seat at kind of the big kids table and be a strategic value to the company. There's some things you need to do and think uh, about differently that kind of open up, um, kind of your career and your company's success. I think what tech exec stuck out and what they shared. Um, Let's see. So some of my favorites. Um, so uh, uh, actually, so a current client and um, uh, a person in the book, um, uh, Woody Ma, um, is the CTO over at Tasty Trade, and uh, his leadership is just so awesome and um, um, devoid of ego, really. And I think one of the one of the things about being a great leader is the ability to just to find the right people and get out of the way. And he tells a story about. Um, you know, they, uh, their business spins off a new business every few months, it seems. And, uh, there was a new business that, um, came up that, um, in the past and in theory should have been his gig. And, um, someone else sort of like, was not necessarily like vying for it, but like, seemed like maybe that's the person who should do it. And, uh, just said, you know, why don't you just do it? And, you know, well, aren't you the CTO? Like, yeah, but this, this should be yours. And so that person ended up becoming a did a great job, became the CTO of that thing. And I think as a leader, um, really like elevated his, um, uh, I don't know, he got a couple extra Jedi points doing that because it really is, it's, it's difficult to do because you want, you want, you want the cool new thing for yourself, but the right thing to do is something else just for the organization. That's a really, that's a tough call to make, I think for most people. And uh, it's the right one. You mentioned Tasty Trade. There's a great interview with Tasty Trade and you, by the way, people should check yeah. out, but um, what kind of work do you do at Tasty Trade? So, um, you know, at a really high level, we're uh, so if we serve two types of customers, um, the first is a company that is um, stuck, like we talked about with a company from Colorado, where they really don't have technology as a core competency and they need someone to take it and run with it. The other kind, which Tasty Trades falls into, is they have people who are great and they're busy with other stuff and they're growing so, they're moving so fast and trying to grow so fast that um, just the sheer, uh, you know, um, the, the, the difficulty of finding people who know what they're doing and, and tacking them on and hiring them and getting them trained up is hard. And so a consulting firm like ours is really good at plugging in uh, kind of the, the, the non-core holes. So we're, 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 we work with them on a lot of their satellite stuff. So, you know, they're, they're busy working on platform and trading and all these other kind of things. And so we might provide, you know, um, things that, you know, orbit around that, like, you know, a customer onboarding experience or, you know, learning management platform. You know, we read that we read their, uh, um, their video uh, platform. They do, you know, like, you know, right now they have a show going on about, you know, the market and trading and futures and all this kind of stuff. And so we rebuilt their platform and how that all works. And so they're just moving too fast. And, you know, and some of our, we have, you know, we can take on a weird expertise, like how to plug into something new um, really quickly with them. And, you know, we work for them. Um, actually, I was, I was thinking about it. It might go back like maybe 17 years to their prior company. Like it's, we've been working together on and off for a long time. Michael, you mentioned uh, customer onboarding experience. You've probably seen thousands of different customer onboarding experiences. Mm. I'm wondering, this is a big one. I mean, it's the first impression you yeah. make. And what are some big mistakes you've seen with companies and how they've crafted and constructed their customer onboarding experience? Um, I love this question. So I think that the the main problem people make is that they make the onboard experience all about them, all about like the company. And here's all the things we want. And here are the hurdles we want you to jump through because we want this information. And um, you really thinking about it from a customer experience point of view, it has to be, I mean, in a way, like at worst mutual and at best, uh, you know, something the customer uh, really finds easy and seamless. Um, 
So I think really like thinking about your onboarding from the customer's point of view, and really it's sort of a, what's necessary to get them in and up and running is probably um, the uh, the best thing to do. And if you've got like a complicated thing, like for example, with Tasty Trade, for example, you might have all kinds of crazy things that you have to, um, you know, sign and upload whatever else, but do you need those right away? I don't know, maybe. Um, and, and I think uh, the other thing, um, you know, and I'm just sort of zeroing in on like that initial, like I'm, I'm in the, you know, the onboarding experience. I think thinking about the, uh, the, the entire journey from, you know, first, you know, first raising your hand and thinking like, this might be something I'm interested in, you know, all the different touch points from, you know, maybe the, you have a campaign around new users that, you know, send some things about how to learn about the platform and, you know, the hurdles they might have to overcome and where people get stuck and, you know, reaching out. And, you know, I, I just got a phone call from a, a company that I, um, that I'm a customer of um, and didn't realize I had a customer service person. And did I need them today? Not really, but I'm delighted to know I have that. And kind of really tracking that whole experience and understanding where customer pain points are, where they're nervous about something, where something goes slower than usual. And, and I think where they go wrong is, you know, it's a one-time gigantic form you have to fill out right now. Um, you know, I, it's funny. I, I think about, I was talking about this with someone the other day, uh, whatever you think of, um, of, uh, of cryptocurrency, um, I almost bought in like years ago, but uh, the platform I was on was asking for driver's license and social security and all this. Stuff. I'm like, I don't know you. And it just made me nervous. And I backed off. And uh, if I'd done it that day, I wouldn't be on this podcast today. I would be on a yacht somewhere in the Caribbean. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's, it's, you know, if they, if they'd managed their onboarding experience a little bit better, realizing that this is a weird ask uh, and that, you know, try to make me feel comfortable about it. Like that was a, a missed opportunity for both of us, sadly. Shoot. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. But I love what you said there about, you know, what do you really need right now? Right. You don't yeah. need to just dump everything onto someone sure. at the beginning. And I'm sure there's stuff in you know, internally we we need to revamp based on this advice. Like, okay, yeah. what do we really need to start? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you mentioned something, you know, what's, <clears throat> what's interesting is you have a company that's this is not their core competency, the technology. And then you on yeah. the opposite have a company like they're all about technology and growing and it goes into um, attracting talent you know, yeah. for you. And so how do you um, attract great talent? That is a great question. Um, I think if there's one thing we do more poorly than anything else, it's that. And it's because we're so in the weeds in the work we're doing that we don't do enough to express to the world what it is that we're all about and why it might be different here. Um, we think we, um, like, for, for example, I would say that our, our hardest hire is finding um, developers who really know what they're doing and want to contribute in a great way. And it's because our, 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 our bias is that the really good guys and gals are out there just doing great at their companies and they love it and they're loved back. And so there's really no reason to move. Um, but the feedback we get from our own teams and from clients is like, wow, you guys do this better than, uh, than, than most. Um, we find that, you know, a lot of times we go in the internal teams have been working together for 10 years and, you know, they don't think we have really anything to offer them. By the time we're done, they're asking us to use our system and how do we do that? And can we adopt your you know, practices, whatever. Um, so one of the ideas I've had about it is to do kind of more media like this. And we're actually starting a, um, a Caxi talk show. Uh, where we're just going to get our developers on and we're going to talk about news of the day and hopefully kind of show you who we are. And I think I mentioned earlier, like we're really all in on fit and we don't want to hide who we are. We just want to like show whatever it is that we do. And, and hopefully there are um, a few perfect fits out there and we want to be able to track them with our little, you know, our little candle. And um, you know, that's, that's currently what we're trying. What comments do you get, Michael, when someone says, you know what? I didn't realize you do things so much differently. What, what are some examples of that? Um, so I think that the, um, the one thing that we, that we really kind of double tripled down on is um, our project management and communication process. Um, the idea being that, you know, really development is, I mean, the table stakes are that you're smart enough to do this and that you, you're competent and can, and can and have built things, right? I mean, that should just be like, if, if that's not there, then what are we even doing? And so, you know, what we really focused on um, developing is a really great process around communicating on a daily basis exactly what's happening, things we need to hear about, you know, things we need input on, ideas that we have, 
And we actually developed some proprietary technology that allows us to sort of collect that all together. So you're not paying for a, a project manager to run reports all day. And so what we get back from people is like, wow, I've never had this much clearer and transparent Keeley. Uh, Keeley is Keeley a word? Uh, let's say it is. Uh, um, I'm a biochemistry major, yeah. Michael. You you don't want to be asking me for let's, uh, let's for put these. it in the dictionary. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, you know, a key point is like you know, we're able to, to deliver all this information, and you're never in the dark. We never hide stuff. Um, we're really good at having a tough conversation. So like, we'd much rather upset you today uh, a little bit than upset you a lot in a month. And so just the the idea that we're coming, you're just like we're just laying it all out every day um, is unusual. I feel like most. Um, you know, most companies like ours sort of, you know, rely on, you know, all-nighters and, you know, kind of like, you know, anything for the client and, you know, don't tell them that, you know, kind of stuff. And we're just like, you know, if something's a bad idea or like, you know, I think we told you it's going to take three days, it's really seven. So how about we don't do that? Here's a different way to do it in three days that might be, because, and we want to give you options and we're, we're, we're going to be true. It's not such a cliche thing. We really want to be partners in the sense that like we're in this together to get a great outcome for both of us. And that's possible hundred percent of the time. Michael, someone's listening to this and they may be an ideal talent for you. What does that look like? What does that person, the ideal talent look like for you? Maybe background wise, maybe experience wise. Sure. I mean, so in a way, some of the stuff we talked about, someone who's, um, who's open to change, isn't rigid, um, likes to learn and teach, um, who uh, um, likes solving new kinds of problems. Um, you know, so when we, when we think about people that haven't worked, like, I know someone actually left us to go work for um, Amazon a while ago, and their job uh, was to just go work on the you may also like section of, you know, the checkout page, which is super interesting, but that's like a department and a job that you do for 10 years, like kind of the same thing. Um, and I think for in, in consulting, um, where we really excel, our people are like, here's this new, th-, and like their eyes get wide here's this new thing that I have no idea how to do. And I'm excited to go figure it out and learn about it. Where some people there's a fork in the road, there's excited and, you know, motivated to go learn about. And there's like terrified, like, what if I screw up? And it's really just like that going back to that growth mindset. Like I'm someone who um, likes to tackle new challenges and will get a little bit of room to go try and figure that out. I think that's, that's one of them. Um, I think the other one is like people who, uh, you know, have owned building a part of a thing not necessarily from scratch, but from scratch is a, a positive. Because one of the things we found is that um, we actually kind of do pretty poorly with people who came from really big companies because we found it's really easy to hide at a really big company like a Sears or even Accenture or something where um, maybe you worked there for seven years, but maybe you didn't do anything and you don't know it. And it's not until you come to a small group, it's like, okay, the three or four of us have to build this whole thing. And you're like, oh, I've never really done that before. What are you guys talking about? So that's been a, that's been a challenge. So like really being able to own. And frankly, so the flip side of that is, you know, if you're somebody who wants to be on a great high achieving team or learn how to do that, um, this is the place to go. Uh, and consulting in general, really, um, because, you know, in, in consulting, in a way, you're held accountable for every hour of what you do, because either you can bill for it or you can't, whereas it's some big company it just gets swept on the rug is my, been my experience. So it's like, a, it's a place if you want to achieve and go fast and grow all that kind of stuff, that's kind of what we do. Michael, I know platforms change, coding languages change. Are there certain kind of like foundational things that they should, you know, be experienced with as far as platforms um, or coding? Yeah. I mean, I guess um, we always say we would take someone who's, who is really experienced and accomplished in something else who wants to learn the things that we happen to be in, frankly, this year. Um, and have them learn them as opposed to someone who's not. So, um, you know, in the weeds, uh, you know, comment would be we're in the JavaScript stack, like a lot of people are, um, you know, React and Node as a focus, but we do some other things too. Um, I think, uh, um, you know, someone who's interested in that or has something to bring to bear there, I think that's always interesting. Um, but in a way, like what we try to, I mentioned like what we were doing this year, um, we try to be, we try to live at the intersection of what people are really excited about generally and what the market and the industry wants to buy. So, you know, um, there's a, there's a thing from Google called go that seems like it might be pretty cool, but no one wants to pay for it. So we're not really going to get into that. Whereas, you know, industry and, you know, enterprises want to build react and node and so, you know, angular app. So great. That's where we're going to be, you know, and, and also people are pretty excited about that. Michael, I have a couple last questions, but first of all, thank you for sharing your hmm. stories and knowledge. Um, and I want to just take a moment and 
send people to your website uh, and they can check out caxi.com at C-A-X-Y.com. Are there any other places online uh, we should point people towards? Um, I think that's the place. If you want to uh, uh, um, enjoy my, uh, my podcast, it's uh, the leadership superpowered podcast. It's on YouTube and, you know, wherever podcasts are listened to uh, kind of thing. Um, so that's always a, uh, that's the, we're blending those brands together. So this should be on the Caxi site uh, as well. Awesome. Yeah. Check out Caxi.com. Uh, Michael, you know, you didn't start your career as a developer, right. Um, but as a musician. So I want to hear what you've learned from, you know, your, your career in music and, and then uh, some of your favorite uh, top songs that you've played. Great. Um, so, uh, so great setup for me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm also, uh, I, I have a whole new podcast based on this question alone. So thank you for setting me up. Cause I don't, I actually don't get to answer it myself on my own podcast, frankly. Um, and this idea that like, I, I've, I've met a lot of musicians in business, uh, uh, including by the way, who I mentioned already, Woody Ma from the Tasty Trades, great trumpet player and other stuff. stuff. Um, and, uh, I feel like that I always, I always get along with, with musicians. There's something about that experience. that's really interesting. And I know for myself, um, I am, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm whenever, uh, you know, I think of like who I am, you know, showing up in business, I'm kind of, I'm naturally an introvert, you know, um, and uh, being in music, especially being on stage, got me used to and comfortable with like being in crowds. And I've played for, you know, really big stuff. Uh, you know, our, our band played at Soldier Field a million years ago um, and, uh, um, you know, been in, you know, a couple of college football stadiums for some of those things. Um, and it, it, it made it so now, now I literally don't care about getting in front of people and, you know, a boardroom of 12 people is like, who cares? You know, um, you know I, I've sung, I've sung Jesse's girl to a crowd of one, you know, kind of thing uh, and, or, or, or a thousand. Um, and uh, uh, so, so that I think like that, that how to show up and, and just be in, you know, in front of a room was something I got for sure. And I also think the, for anyone who's ever been in a band, um, the sort of the constant um, inter negotiations of a band, figuring out, you know, what are we going to play? How are we going to play it? When's we're, all that kind of stuff. That's there's, there's a leadership company um, element to that, that, that I, I think I learned a lot from. Um, and I think just the, and then the last one I, I was I think about is like just being comfortable with impro, impro, in, in, improvising and, uh, and being wrong and trying it again. That, that I think was a precursor to how I, I ended up thinking about agile. Um, Love it. You know, Negotiation, you improvising, yeah. uh, getting in front of a crowd. Sure. Um, that maybe that's your next book, you know, maybe. Yeah. Stay tuned. Um, favorite songs that you've played. Um. It's funny. Uh, so I am as a uh, 80s uh, guitar person, um, hair metal falls right into my sweet spot. Um, and uh, I think I've only ever gotten to play this one once live, but I always wanted to play Hot for Teacher by Van Halen, which is not very, um, a song you couldn't do today. Um, and I was really excited to do it. And we played it two years ago, uh, maybe it's three years ago at a, at a benefit. And I was so excited to do it. Um, but as soon as the song, so if you know that song, but it starts with a big drum intro and then the guitar comes in. And as soon as the guitar came in, the lighting person, unbeknownst to me, started this crazy strobe thing happening. And it threw me off so much. I kind of, I was like, what's happening right now? And I totally screwed up the intro on my one shot of ever, to, ever doing it. Um, but I think we were so loud that no one noticed. And they said I did a great job. But I remember being like, man, tell me if I'm going to run, you're going to run those strobes in my face. <laughs> I would like to know. Yeah. We need to redo. I do. I would love a re please. Do you still play? Yeah. Um, uh, quick plug playing this Saturday in Libertyville. Um, if anyone wants to show up, I don't know when these come out. It'll probably be after, but uh, May, was it May 7th, May 9th, whatever. What's the band Saturday. called? Rock City 7. So we still do a few shows a year. I'm also playing Libertyville days this year. Um, and it's a great, it's the best possible distraction from business because one of the things I talk about with people who are in music is, um, unlike, you know, when, uh, you know, how many of us have been watching a movie while also somehow simultaneously reading your phone and eating a thing. And like, when you're doing mu music, you can't not be a hundred percent involved in it, or you will screw it up. So the idea of it's, it's one of the few places I can completely leave the business and all the stuff I'm thinking about behind. Uh, and that's a good, that's a good reset for me. Caxi rock city seven, Michael, thank you so much. 
Thanks for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 